I'd like to turn to a panel that we've pulled together of representatives from organizations that have been calling for inclusion of health in national and regional climate policy making, including the NDCs and also not limited to the NDCs, to kind of hear from that kind of national and regional perspective of health organizations actively working on this issue. We have three panelists with us today. We have Dr. Gatinji Gatahi, um, the CEO of AMREF Health Africa. We have Ms. Ann Stouffer, uh, Deputy Director and Strategic Lead from the Health and Environment Alliance. And we have Dr. Ed Maybach, Professor and Director of the Center for Climate Change Communications at George Mason University, as well as Board of Advisors Liaison for the U.S. Medical Society Consortium on Climate Change and Health. And I will note as well that Dr. Maybach and Ms. Stouffer are both members of the GCHA Board of Directors, and Dr. Gatahi sits on the um, WHO Civil Society Working Group on Climate Change and Health, as does Ms. Stouffer. Let's start with you, Dr. Gatahi, uh, for a brief opening remarks from you about your work to, uh, and AMREF Health Africa's work to include health in climate policies and your thoughts on the NDCs. Well, thank you very much. And, and I, I want to just reflect on some of the things that have been said, including what I think of the NDCs and uh, of, the, of the COCAD itself. One of the things I would like to pick is today, I just saw an article coming out of the Lancet uh, Planetary, Planetary Health indicating that malaria and dengue fever are going to actually affect more than 8 billion people by 2080, largely because uh, you know, of the warming uh, of, the cli- of, the, of the climate. And also it's going to move further and extend also the transmission period. So there's this study that's actually showing uh, directly, and I think it's a study of about 1st of July or so. So there are many other examples we can give, including displacement, including, for example, pneumonia relationship because of clean air, pneumonia in children, and um, also the fact that those people in, in fragility are even more affected because of displacement, and therefore their health systems are not able to take care of them when there's a climate you know, extreme event. So there are many, many things that, uh, that we can talk about. But because of the absence of time, the one thing I really want to talk about is the role of civil society. Uh, I have looked at the scorecard itself, and we have this same challenge with health, where we have voluntary national reports, and not health, in SDGs, where we have voluntary national reports. And in this particular scorecard, I l- looked very hard for the role of accountability, and uh, beyond just looking at the national, the NDC itself, and asking this, myself the question, where is civil society? Where is private sector? Where are the people who are involved in developing the NDCs? And I think that if you have to make the NDCs successful, we have also to insist that the NDCs are co-developed with multi-stakeholder action, that the NDCs are developed and there is evidence that there was private sector involvement as they were developed and there was civil society involvement in, the, in, in their development. And that should be scored because at the end of the day, it's easy for a government to put it together, whether it's conditional or unconditional, and then do nothing about it. So I think that's, for me, is the biggest call for you, that we need to look at an accountability framework and demand or, you know, at the COP26, push for it to be included in the NDC plans and push for this COCA to include that measure in terms of uh, countries' optimization of the NDCs. I think that's the one thing I would like to highlight because of uh, lack of time. If I have time, I'll come back to one or two other issues. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, excellent point. And thank you so much for raising that. And I think in the countries or regions that the three of you represent that, you know, you all are, are rep- showcasing that indeed civil society, uh, and in this case, health civil society is taking a voice and trying to influence these, but formalizing that process and measuring how countries are doing on that process is a, a really excellent suggestion for something that we could consider going forward. So next, I'd like to turn to you, Anne, and and hear some remarks from you and reflections from you on all of this. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be part of this conversation, this important one. Uh, HEAL is an alliance of over 90 member organizations from the European region. And uh, we were one of the first organizations in Brussels, you know, at EU level to speak about uh, climate and health and how actually health concerns need to be central to climate efforts uh, that are taking place. And when I look back at the last decade, uh, when it comes to the the level of awareness in the health community, and I think also level of engagement, we've really seen
seen an incredible increase in that. Uh, I remember really well, you know, at uh, COP 2009, which was uh, my first COP and the first time also Heal brought a health delegation to COP. And we were basically a small number of people, including uh, WHO colleagues and the non-governmental sector. And I think within within then, you know, the year since that, since 2009, we've seen so many more health, uh, you know, individuals, but also organizations engaged. And that includes, for example, the Standing Committee of European Doctors, or bringing together all the national medical associations, issuing a statement that includes, you know, Germany, where there's a very active and growing network on climate and health, but also, um, you know, other countries in the European region, which have been more, uh, more resistant and where there's been a lot more skepticism. For example, in Poland, we've seen last year the first uh, ever health sector statement on climate. And we recently had a conversation with Western Balkans health colleagues who are also increasingly confronted with these issues because, for example, of heat wake waves. And all of this, this awareness and really this this growing health movement uh, is unfortunately not translated yet into the right level of commitment from our policymakers. And that's why it's actually no surprise, uh, but it's very unfortunate to see the scoring, you know, for the EU, because we we don't have, you know, a commitment there when it comes to both understanding how Europe is actually vulnerable to climate change impacts. We know from the latest Lancet countdown that uh, Europe, the European region is, you know, the most vulnerable to the heat related impact, the health related impacts of heat. And we have but we have seen that, you know, in the latest round of negotiations for the EU's 2030 commitment, really the time this decade is where we need to see the, the swift decarbonization taking place. Uh, and we have seen an upping of the EU's goal from formerly minus 40% by 2030 to now minus 55. But we know that this is still inadequate and not ambitious to actually deal with the urgency to act. Uh, and according to the science and with a, with a view to protecting our health, we would need to see minus 60 65% greenhouse gas reductions uh, at least. But I think not all is lost. We're still in the process. So, you know, in the next weeks and months ahead of the COP, there are important opportunities if you want to rectify this situation and for the EU to really show global leadership. And I think that's also a role that the EU needs to take for historical reasons. And there is clearly a, you know, a responsibility that the EU has as an industrialized region to take the leadership. And that is with the upcoming um, EU's Fit for 55 package, which of about a dozen legislative initiatives that now need to follow suit. It's called Fit for 55, but actually it should be called Fit for 1.5. And the EU and the, and the, the you know, the national decision making really should now overshoot and really step up for the swift decarbonization that we need to see happening and for the protection of our health. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne. Yes, absolutely excellent point that the submission of an NDC is not the end of the story. And there are opportunities to take the findings of the scorecard and use that as a, a moment to kind of demand that the implementation policies really carry forward what didn't get articulated in the NDC. So it's a real opportunity to continue to push for the, the policies that we need. Okay. And now I'd like to turn over to Ed, for your thoughts on these matters. Ed, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, just two quick points that I'd like to make. The, the first one is it comes to no surprise to any of you that, that the U.S. was sort of running away from the Paris Climate Agreement and our global commitments on to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement as, as rapidly as we could over the past four years. Things have changed uh, since January of this year. We now have a president and an administration who are making this a top priority. And as a matter of fact, they're making it one of four of their top priorities, health, equity, jobs, and climate change. And it's an administration that really does see the interconnectedness of these issues. They're very ambitious. Their RNDC is very ambitious with regard to our GHG uh, emission reductions, but Despite that, it's really interesting to see that while we are mobilizing an all-of-government approach to climate change, health really hasn't yet been included. And so it really underscores the importance of what we are doing to make sure that health is a primary consideration. I think the healthy NDC scorecard and the fact that the U.S. got a, a you know, what could only be interpreted as a failing grade on that scorecard of 40% is going to be 
seen as a slap in the face by our administration. I'm happy to report that my impression of our administration is when they take a slap on the face, they don't punch back. They say, well, you know, what is it we can do better? And I think we're laying the basis for them to help to understand what they can do better to really bring health as, as at the center of our all of government response to, to climate change. So, you know, I, I think we it's, it's curious. I think there are probably reasons of historic inertia why health isn't at the center of our all-of-government response. But right now is our opportunity to overcome that historic inertia and make sure that our voices are being heard, that our, the health uh, organizations are really, and the health voices are really at the, the front and center of that conversation. A criticism that I've heard about the healthy NDC scorecard, however, and I think this is really worth noting, is that it, it's a scorecard based on the rhetoric of what countries put in their NDC. That was by, uh, <laughs> there just wasn't any other way around it. You know, I've talked to Jess and, and Jenny and the team about why it, what, how the scorecards were done. And we, they could only score on the commitments that countries made. So by definition, it was a score issue based on what we say, our rhetoric. I would say the real importance, the most important, the, the central importance of why it is so, what our opportunity is to make sure that the health considerations are first and foremost is because we know, I personally know, because my research over the past four or five or six years has focused on this, I know that health is the primary consideration of members of the public. When we talk about climate change as a human health issue, and when we talk about it as a profound health opportunity, people lean in, people engage. It becomes much more concrete. It becomes much more obvious what our skin is in this game. It is literally that of ourselves, our children, our family members, and our community members. This is the best frame in which to talk about the threat and the opportunities associated with responding to climate change. And it helps to address a fundamental conundrum that we have learned from the field of behavioral economics over the past 10 or 20 years. And that fundamental conundrum is that homo sapiens are reluctant to incur costs today for benefits that accrue in the future right? That is the climate change challenge right there. We're asking nations of the world to incur costs today for benefits in the future, except when we talk about it as a health problem, we're asking nations of the world to incur costs for benefits today, profound benefits today, benefits we've already heard based on earlier speakers will pay for themselves in terms of better health, reduced healthcare costs. And so it really helps to, by reframing the whole issue around climate and health, it really helps to solve that behavioral economics conundrum. We're no longer asking nations to, to pay today for benefits in the future, but we're asking them to, to pay today for benefits today and for benefits primarily in their own countries right? Not for diffuse benefits worldwide, but if, you know, to the extent that the U.S. takes action, to the extent that my community in Virginia takes action, we are the primary beneficiaries today, which again is fundamentally helpful in reframing away from this challenge, this, this conundrum of behavioral economics and towards a psychology that can gain political traction. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think a really clear articulation of why presenting the health case for climate action can be so powerful in, in so many ways and can help motivate the, the speed and the level of action that we really need to see at this point, because we really are at a point where we have no time to waste. I'd like to pose a question to all three of our panelists. I'd like to invite you to respond to, to any of the comments from the other panelists that you'd like to take up and or in addition to think about any advice you might give to other health organizations or climate or other types of organizations considering being more active on the issue of healthy NDCs and health in national climate policies. So responding to one another, to, if there are any threads you'd like to pick up, and then any advice you have to organizations who would like to, to have a bigger voice in advancing health in climate policies. Anne or Gatinji, either of you like to, to go first? 
I can start in terms of the, the advice to other organizations. Please come forward. Please join the conversations, uh, you know, the communications, the advocacy on climate change and especially on, on the mitigation part. And I think the, the co-benefits framing and, uh, you know, bringing forward the data on co-benefits is still the most uh, powerful message that we have there. It's one, you know, that still can resonate with a lot of people. It's one that we can still expand on. And then I think connected to that is a very much a need and opportunity to bring in those of us from the health community that look into tackling inequalities because I see that at least in Europe the the question of leaving no one behind in the mitigation measures that are being taken is becoming more and more important and I think for us as the health community we do have great expertise on if you want reconciling social concerns with you know, um, the benefits of mitigation action and that is something I think can can bring in new people and new voices and you know help grow the movement that we need to see happening in order really to, uh, to achieve urgent decarbonization. And I'll probably like to comment as well, just to say, number one, that other organizations, you know, we joined, we, we joined the GCHA more recently, and we've started working with countries, uh, specifically more recently, South Africa, to create their, uh, you know, NDC and uh, bring other civil society organizations, like the Public Health South, uh, Association of South Africa and the South African Medical Association. But I would like to tell to other organizations that this is so critical, and especially even what Andy is saying, that we need to bring health organizations into this conversation. And number two is that if it hasn't happened in a country, it's not happened anywhere. You know, this conversation can happen. We can do it every day. We can have a webinar every day. But until the action happens in a country where policies are made and they make a difference, it's not happened. So we need to come on board to ensure that it happens in our countries. And that is the call I'm making to ensure that these NDCs in future include accountability and joint action and multi-actor action so that we then change the, you know, our scorecard to reflect that in future. The final point is we have recently formed what we call the Coalition for Partnership of UHC and Global Health. It was announced at the High Level Political Forum today, and it includes multiple health players, you know, Stop TB, Stop Malaria, UHC, uh, HIV, TB, and Malaria, uh, Partnership for Maternal Health and Child Health. And I would recommend that actually this movement of, glo of, of the, the GCHA considers joining that coalition as well, because this needs not be a vertical issue of climate change. It needs to be a healthy issue, as, as, as Ed was saying, and then to become more urgent. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd like to just add one final thought for me, which is that especially now, you know, 16 months into, a, into the, the COVID pandemic, I know that we all feel like people aren't listening. Our, our nation's leaders, our communities aren't necessarily listening to our voices. It's been somewhat disempowering, if not profoundly disempowering. But what we forget is we are, are actually the trusted, the most trusted class of professionals in every country in the world, right? Health professionals occupy a unique, highly trusted niche in every human society. We need to lean into that. We need to take advantage of that. In a prior call today for, with GCHA, somebody said, what we need is one message, many voices. And as we move into COP26, we absolutely have to consolidate our many trusted voices behind one powerful message. It's an extraordinary opportunity. And I think that we forget how powerful we can be. Mikhail Gorbachev, in his autobiography, Perestroika, he wrote about the, the incredibly important role that a a relatively small number of health professionals, physicians all, at IPPNW, the role that they played in convincing he and President Reagan to sign the uh, Global Test Ban Treaty. And he basically said, look, their argument isn't political, it's science-based. They'd left no room for reasonable people to disagree. And that is our opportunity today to do exactly the same. Well, thank you so much to our extraordinary panelists for all of your thoughts and remarks.